It's a couple of minutes after the top of the hour, but it is what it is. 22nd of March, 2023, the moment the hour cometh. And of course, this is the summit. We are scaling heights to bring you what you need, and that is conversations from across the world when it comes to different issues that matter to you, where we are putting them on the table to dissect them and make sense out of them. And of course, this is your show, and all you need to do is get in touch with us, talk to us through all the available platforms. That is on Twitter, and the hashtag as always is the summit RW. You need to add that every time you tweet and any comment that you make, please remember to add that particular hashtag. It is very important because it helps us to be able to track and sample some of the comments that you are sending concerning the conversations we have. We had actually put out something out there concerning the show tonight and I want us just to sample some of that uh, as we set out to start the conversation that we have today. And we've been asking you what you feel and what you think about the topic for tonight. And one of the tweet or tweets uh, Jean-Luc Ishimwe says, at the summit RW with the greatest one, Eugene and Angwe, very humbled and I'm very happy to be here. And of course, Janet Schaefer says and responds to what we had tweeted earlier on and says, yes, let the message reach the administration. All seems to have landed on deaf ears for those few months Kenya Kwanza has been in power. We're trying to look into the issue of consensus politics and whether this is something that the continent should be looking into. And I want you to be part of this conversation because... We are on for another great show. And my name, as always, is Eugene Anangwe. Let me introduce my panelists on the show who are joining us from far and wide. I'm not alone. Of course, it might look like that. But technology is what it is. And it is helping us to connect with our viewers and our audience. And, of course, those who are joining us as part of the conversation tonight. Allow me to introduce for the very first time uh, to the Rwandan audience, the Pan-African audiences right here, uh, Javas Bigambo, who's a governance expert, joining us all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. Javas, thank you so much for making time to join us on the summit. Also with us is none other than uh, Ongama Mtimka, who's a political analyst, joining us from the Nelson Mandela University. That is where he's based in South Africa. Thank you so much for making time to join us on this particular conversation tonight. Thank you for having me. Indeed. And of course, we also have Ndegwa uh, Njiru, who's a constitutional lawyer, also joining us uh, from Nairobi. Gentlemen, um, it is important that I also make a disclaimer that we had invited Carol uh, Karioki, who's the uh, CEO of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. And on last minute, she got engaged on some other pressing matters, and she will not be able to join us on the show. However, the show must continue. I want to start off, uh, first of all, with our brothers from Nairobi, uh, we saw a lot of showdowns across Nairobi. We saw something in South Africa. There was, uh, 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 you know, some commotion as well in uh, Tunisia. Let me start off with Nairobi. Javas, from where you sit, I mean, uh, what do you read from the events that took place um, uh, in Nairobi and, of course, the announcements that now, you know, the protests are going to be taking place every Monday and Thursday uh, from a perspective of solutions focused uh, initiatives. Do you see anything tangible coming out of this from where you speak? And maybe for our viewers who might not be understanding the context of what's going on in Nairobi, maybe you could also take some time and share with us. Javas. Is it, is it your sound that is on mute? Eugene, can you yes, hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. I know, I mean, yes, let's go <laughs> okay. now. Let's take it uh, one more time. All right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Monday this week was a very exciting period, or day rather, given that it was the first response by a people who are the followers and uh, admirers, or if you like, sympathizers of... Um, the Azimio uh, coalition led by Honorable Raila Odinga, who was a candidate in the August 2022 general election. Mm. And of course, the critical issues that advanced or are being advanced by Azimio as the basis upon which 
the demonstrations were called. Uh, a part of the eight point agenda, but I'll single out a few issues. One of them is the high cost of living. Second, there is the allegation of uh, high taxation. Three, there is the discontent on the part of Ray Lodinga and Azimio with the outcome of the August 2022 general election where he still claims that he is the legitimate winner or victor of that election and that President William Ruto is not, as well as other issues. Now, well, these issues are mixed up. Some of them quite critical, urgent and legitimate. Mm. Others that may not necessarily be so pressing because among the eight-point agenda issues that Raila Odinga has outlined includes that the claim that, for example, the Kenya Kwanzaa government led by Dr. William Ruto has not fulfilled its mandate since it took office about um, six months ago. Mm. All this is springing from the August 8th election. Of course, as the world knows, as uh, Kenyans know, is that Honorable Ray Odinga has not conceded defeat and he has not acknowledged the legitimacy of the authority of um, the government as led by Honorable William Ruto as the uh, president of Kenya. So all these things, jumbled up as they are, constitute the basis upon which the protests and demonstrations have been called by Azimio led by Honorable Ray Odinga. So there are critical legal issues, critical uh, political issues, or, and other socioeconomic issues that are part of the significant agenda being set by Honorable Raila Odinga, which now has informed him that uh, he needs to press the urgency button even further. And now he has slated every Monday and Thursday of every week as days marked for demonstrations in the country. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I want to hear also from uh, uh, Ongama. In, in South Africa, we also, uh, you know, saw uh, similar scenes, um, uh, you know, of protest in, in the streets of uh, South Africa. From where you sit, I mean, let, let's try to make sense of, of what was taking place there and, and the overall goal. And, and at the end of it all, I mean, what is the place of consensus politics, uh, you know, in, in, in avoiding uh, such scenarios or, you know, the grievances that are being put out there by those who are pushing for these ways of pressing, you know, administrations to act on some of the things that they feel are pressing. Is this the way to go, really? Sure. Uh, good evening to you and your viewers in Rwanda. It's honored. Uh, it's an honor to be, uh, you know, on your platform. It's interesting that the, the issues are almost similar save for the fact that we haven't had a recent election in South Africa. What's happened recently is that uh, the uh, chairperson or, or the, the president or the so-called commander-in-chief of the Economic Freedom Fighters, uh, the third biggest political party in South Africa, which is a splinter of the governing party, the African National Congress, called for a national shutdown as a way to express public anger over the rampant load shedding, a word for power blackouts in the country, because South Africa has suffered uh, a, a inse energy insecurity since the late 2007. Uh, but in recent years, there has been allegations that the state utility, which is the sole provider of electricity in South Africa, is acting in bad faith in order to precipitate a, 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 a rapid process towards energy transition to renewable energies. And the recent chief executive, uh, that entity actually has lost its chief executive, and South Africans are experiencing long periods of load shedding, and there are concerns about uh, how that could cripple various industries in the country, and the cost is estimated at billions of friends. Mm -hmm. The frustrating issue is that there wasn't a feeling that President Cyril Ramaphosa mm -hmm. was getting a hold, a, 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 a control of the situation, and South Africans have faced rising interest rates, inflation stabilized in the last quarter of last year, but data that came out today shows that inflation has gone back 
up again. So there are concerns about a rising cost of living. Yeah. So the EFF yeah. in a nutshell is uh, was foregrounding those issues, demanding for the resignation yeah. of the president. But there's a view that they're also kickstarting their election campaign for the next national general election next year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hear you. And, and I want to hear from Dego. Dego, you are a constitutional lawyer, but um, uh, from what I've seen, you have actually been a, a pro what is going on in, 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 in Nairobi today in terms of uh, the pressure um, being mounted on the government of the day. But what I'm, I'm going to ask from where you sit and from even your own, um, uh, you know, what you do as a constitutional lawyer, why not use um, the constitutional uh, you know, ways to fix uh, whatever is, is being mentioned as part of the grievances? Because there are those who are asking, at what point then has the Kenyan constitution uh, failed for it to be able to allow for what is actually going on today? And is it even possible to reverse some of the constitutionally, um, uh, you know, uh, stuff that the government of the day is saying, look, we are going to just stick to what the Constitution says. Uh, we have proceeded to actually uh, go ahead in the uh, appointment of uh, the membership of the IEBC. The president elected uh, was, was actually, uh, uh, there was a contest. It went through the Supreme Court as dictated by the Constitution. The, the, the Supreme Court made a ruling out of it. You know, uh, uh, where is the space for what the Constitution says in dealing with these issues to a point that now this mass action is being seen as the way forward. Thank you, Nangwe. Thank you, the viewers. Uh, and, and even the ones that are listening us from South Africa. Mm. This is a great Pan-African debate that uh, has enjoined mm. people who are suffering from the same struggles. Mm. The EFF in South Africa and the Azimio Laumoja in Kenya are suffering from the same, same cause of struggle. Uh, and the cause of struggle is, it has been necessitated by the constitutional suppression, suppression of the sovereignty of the people and the voice of the people. The reason why we have advocated for the streets is because just like in South Africa, and I've been following the South African parliament closely, which, is, which squares out one for one with the Kenyan parliamentary system, is that in, in South Africa, the majority have decided to suppress the minority. Mm. And so it is even here in Kenya, that the majority, who well, in Kenya, Kwanzaa, they have decided to suppress the minority in parliament. Mm. What am I saying? I'm saying that in those two countries, parliament has become an extension of the executive. And remember it is in parliament, Anangwe, that we speak about the question of representation. Mm -hmm. It is in parliament that we speak about the question of oversight. Mm. When, when the South African parliament is suppressing the EFF through Comrade Malema, the Kenyan parliament is suppressing the Azimiola Umoja members of parliament. Mm. So the people are left without any avenue of ventilating their issues. We are left without any avenue of ventilating our grievances. And so the only thing that, is, that remains, both in South Africa and in Kenya, is for the people to take to the streets. Mm. And remember, taking to the streets and angry mm. is a constitutional provision. And you know, our constitution has largely borrowed from the South African constitution. And the South African constitution, just like the Kenyan constitution, has appreciated the place of mass action. It has appreciated the mass of people exercising their sovereignty directly. So what happens here, Anangwe, is that uh, as a result of this oppression, as a result of this constitutional exclusion, and as a result of, of this political exclusion by the majority who are in government, mm. people are left with only one way of venting their grievances, and that is to take to the streets. For example, when it comes to the question of the amendment of the IBC Act mm. and, uh, and to the formula in which the, co the, the commission was to be constituted, the whole process was rushed through parliament. There was no quality debate. There was no pu public participation that was done. And when it was done, it was done in a skewed manner. Let me, let, let me, let me bring, I think, fast forward. 
as close as yesterday, cabinet passed a bill, an unconstitutional bill, that is tiered to one privatization of public property. Mm. And what has happened today in parliament? Shamelessly, the leader of majority in parliament, even without giving it a, thing, a constitutional thinking, has tabled that bill to parliament. And you know what, Anangwe? The bill will pass through because parliament has been captured by the executive mm. in this country. Mm. Mm. And so that is the tragedy, that is the democratic tragedy we find ourselves in. Yeah. And for us to be able to redeem the, the democratic space and redeem our constitution, mm. we have to go to the street and express ourselves in a manner that makes sense to them that are in government. Interesting that you mentioned that, and I want to bring in Javas from a governance perspective and also from a constitutional perspective. Javas, listening in to um, uh, what Dego is saying, and uh, let's pick out one of the issues that is actually a, a teething point here, and that is the uh, you know, legitimacy of the current regime, uh, which, as Emil says, you know, they do not recognize um, uh, the current uh, president uh, because they don't accept that he actually won in a fair and uh, square manner. Look, the Constitution provided avenues of dealing with this issue. There is the aspect of if you're not contented with this, you can actually be able to petition the Supreme Court and, and file a petition to challenge the results. That was done. And the Supreme Court did actually pronounce itself on this particular issue. Fast forward, we are now, you know, close to 90 days actually or more after the vote. And we're talking about reversing all that after going through all those particular processes because there's a whistleblower who the president actually is saying is unknown. We can't know who this person is. Is there even a possibility of this under the current Kenyan constitution of reversing all these things? <laughs> at this well, point in time? Eugene, that's a very deep and important question altogether. And as I respond to that, I would also reflect a bit on what uh, my brother uh, Njiro has said. Mm. And of course, some issues that have been raised by my brother Njiro are not quite factual. Eh? Mm -hmm. Or there is some uh, slippery statements that he has made. For instance, one that Parliament yesterday passed uh, a bill about privatization. Uh, Parliament did not pass that bill. It was the, the cabinet yes. that deliberated on that. And uh, yeah, the cabinet's approval then will follow with uh, a parliamentary discussion through the uh, legislative process. Secondly, he said that um, with regard to the amendment of the IBC Act, that there was no public participation. And then I, he ended up saying that if it happened, it happened in a very rushed way. There is no statute in Kenya that can pass master and be assented into uh, by uh, assented up into uh, assented by the president if it has not had public participation and if parliament has not debated the issues contained in that particular bill mm -hmm. on the floor of the house. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, if we are to talk about the push and pull between the opposition and the executive. Yeah. Today, there was a very important discussion on the floor of the House, the Parliament in Kenya, yeah. about the cost of electricity. And Parliament was not even populated by a, a third of its membership, including members from the opposition. Mm -hmm. So the priorities of the parliamentarians are elsewhere. And that's why they are playing politics and not speaking to critical issues of public interest. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, my brother in general was spoken to issues to do with um, the parliament having been, uh, or the, the executive having procured various parliamentarians from the, from the opposition, and therefore that necessitates going to the street. As a matter of fact, we know that all the issues that are happening today following the legitimate discontent or discontent on the part of Raila Odinga about the outcome of the election, Honorable Raila Odinga is exploring all avenues and exercising his political rights 
as provided for in Article 37 of the Constitution. Mm. But as a matter of fact, we know that this is political fundamentalism to explore our personal interests. All these, of course, are fashioned as public interest. Now, we know very well that the issue of the cost of living is very important. And in fact, the people have got a right to raise and even picket and demonstrate any time. Yeah. The issue of the high taxation, very crucial. But look, let's face it. If it's a question of the outcome of the election, we cannot lose faith in the, legislate, the, the constitutional mechanisms that have been provided for in the mother of or the source of laws of this country that the constitution is. And in fact, having exhausted the mechanisms of arbitration, because the, the, the Supreme Court is the one that arbitrates over a presidential petition and settles the matter finally. Correct. I think the pursuit presently by Azimio and the Honorable Ray Lodinga, a celebrated politician, will not yield much with regard to any imagined reversal of the outcome of the presidential election held in August 2022. And in fact, the issue of the victory of Honorable Ray Odinga and claiming and sustaining such argument will remain just simulacrum, will remain a, a figment of imagination because this election has been done, dusted, and the only thing that can change the status of our President William Ruto is either an act of God or an election that will happen in 2027. Right. And, 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 and before I bring uh, Ndegwa to do a, a rejoined, I, I, I want to talk to uh, Mr. Ongama. I mean, uh, we've had Javas talk about, you know, the outcome, uh, the expected outcome of those who are actually pursuing this way um, of, of, of putting or piling pressure on, uh, you know, the governments uh, where they are to be able to achieve what they feel needs to be done. Um, uh, as opposed to a matter of looking for other alternatives, including consensus building uh, and all that. When it comes to South Africa, what, what, what do you see as the end game, the outcome uh, of, of whatever has been going on right there from what we saw uh, in the part of this week? In fact, there are correlations here. Um, one, there are grievances that are well known. Two, there is the role played by an opposition uh, grouping. And thirdly, I think it's more complex in Kenya with the recent election and the results thereof. In South Africa, the issues, and I think also uh, in Kenya, this issue of how the state handled the protests. The issue was that, one, many of us were saying the opposition political party has taken the right issues and that it is they who have a, an agenda which may be different from what the average South African, you know, wants is secondary to the issue of the fact that there are national grievances that need to be attended to. Yeah, yeah. However, the state in responding to the security threats elements within those protests needed to deploy the army in South Africa. And I was one among a few people that are arguing that we mustn't allow our idealism about, you know, uh, what role uh, should be played by the police vis-a-vis -vis the army in, in public order policing and allow that to cloud our judgment when the state assesses a security risk and makes a situational decision to say the best response is to is to actually you know quell the the, the 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 storm in that way and arrest people who are destroying public property because the very same people are complaining about a cost of living you know are going to be concerned about the the the, the infrastructure that is being destroyed as a result of the march right. so i find those correlations uh, to be quite interesting Interesting. And, and, and I want to hear from Degua. Degua, I mean, what's the end goal? Look, 
we heard from the deputy president talking about over 20 billion lost just on that particular day. Nairobi County itself lost over 40, um, we're talking about 40 million or something, um, uh, just f uh, from vandalism and all that. In South Africa, we heard of loss of lives, including in Kenya, young students, uh, uh, you know, uh, university students were losing their lives. So what was the end goal? I mean, isn't there any other way uh, of, of, of dealing with these issues um, uh, other than going to the streets? Allow me to remind our viewers and those that are, were not in Kenya, never followed the Kenyan situation, yeah. is that it is the police that is killing the demonstrators. It is not the demonstrators that are killing the police. The police is the one that is using live ammunition against an armed members of public who are deliberately exercising their constitutional rights. The see, unfortunate thing is that the government of the day yeah. did not support the constitution processes in 2010 and they therefore do not appreciate when we say that there is a constitutional right to picketing and to demonstration that's fine De De what i'm asking is right yeah. now yes. the end goal is what and look at the end of the day if the, the government loses this uh, money in terms of the losses to businesses the lack of revenue in terms of taxes because people close down their shops the losses of lives and all that how then do you end up achieving the goals of the listed items that you want achieved in the end that you have taken to prosecute in the public domain or in the court of public opinion mm -hmm. is that our people are hungry there is no medicine our people are oppressed i'm asking one simple question if we are complaining of loss of two billion mm -hmm. where is this two billion why can where was it yesterday when there was no demonstration mm -hmm. that the same has not been appropriated to one fighting a solution of the high cost of living where was that money yesterday and last week, the two billion every day? That the same is lacking in circulation to the extent that the, now the dollar is exchanging at 100 and almost 40. Mm. So the argument that the demonstrations are fettering the processes of revenue generation is, is defeatist in itself. Mm. For one simple reason, that the money that they want to save is not being appropriated towards elevating the plight of the people. And the thing is this, we are not only looking at the, at the, at the economic perspective, mm. because the economic perspective must have a solid foundation of the political, uh, the political foundation. Mm. When the political foundation is shaking, the social foundation will shake and the economic foundation will shake. Mm. And what I'm simply saying is, nobody should underrate the place of public or, uh, or public demonstration. Mm. I would remind our viewers that in, in 1879, King Louis XVI was brought down by mass action. Mm. Our views, viewers must remember that Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the non-violence movement, was able to change the course of what we know today as India. We should not lose sight that Malcolm X, uh, together with uh, Luther King Jr., were able to change the, the place and the plight of the black American through the, the use of mass action. Yeah. And then, the, and context, then, the context, I'm sure, are very, are, are very different from, from these examples that, that, that you give. But I, I want to understand, um, you know, from basics in, in yes. terms of the yes. end goal, uh, you know, for how long then? And then, then what? You know, those are some of the questions that I'm sure some of our viewers uh, would love to understand. You see, we have until the day the grievances that we are prosecuting in the, in the public arena are met to the, to the satisfaction of the people who are leading the people's, uh, 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 the people's uh, uh, liberation to the extent that they will address those ones to the satisfaction of the people, mm. then we, we, we will have a conversation. Mm. But remember one thing, Anangwe. Mm. Remember one key thing. This is the government that has said that they are running this government as a company. Mm. What that means, Anangwe, is that they have completely decided to exclude any person 
who did not vote for them. So over half of the country, or actually three quarters of the country, have been excluded from the table. We have become, uh, we have become, uh, we, we, we have become spectators. The government says they cannot touch us, they cannot hear us, they cannot listen to us, they cannot talk to us. Mm. Yet, we need to move together as, as, as a cohesive nation. So until those issues are addressed, our people will go the streets. Interesting. Javas, I, I want to hear your take on where we went wrong, especially when it comes to inclusive politics, and, and, and whether we have the time to salvage this, especially from what we call the consensus model of politics. I mean, if you look at the Kenyan situation and probably other jurisdictions, we know that uh, you know, there is what we call the winner takes it all. Uh, uh, you know, is, is this where the rain started beating these countries that have this kind of political model, uh, whereby, you know, you have a number two who commands, you know, almost half of the population that voted, but they get totally nothing because they did not win, uh, 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 you know, elective position at the top uh, job. Is this where the problem is coming from? And how do we remodel this to have a scenario where everybody feels this is our country. You know, anytime we blow up anything or shoot down uh, someone or break a window right there, it is actually for us. We are killing our own selves. We are making ourselves bleed. H how long and when will we have this kind of thinking to be able to fix uh, our, our, our democracies in, in that particular perspective? Eugene, you ask what the problem is and where the rain is beating us. Mm. In fact, the rain has always been beating us. There's no point where we can say that it's a particular station where when it started. The rain has always been beating us right from the time of independence or even way before. Secondly, there are critical issues that are absent in our body politic. Yeah. One is political ethicism. Two is the place of values. That we even make or de uh, develop values develop statutes that we intend to serve for uh, in our interest against other persons mm. and not for all of us as a collective we expect that laws should help us to hold other people to account yeah. and not ourselves that is the other problem but when i look at it even from what ndegwa said and some things i think uh, could be not just unbundled but uh, uh, debunked first i think it is a bit erroneous and inaccurate to say that um only, the government is only serving those persons that voted for, for it. Where can it be established that particular persons are identified that voted or did not vote? It cannot be established. It is only a matter of presumption yeah. or assumption, rather. Yeah. Secondly, I think one thing that we need to have a discussion about is not just a matter of occupying office. It is a matter of looking at the framework of our democracy and making it work in our interest, not for the interest just of the political elites who in Kenya have hijacked the process. Mm. I can tell you even what uh, Brother Ndegwa is talking about, the pre-referendum issues in 2010, pre-2010 issues of the politics and who supported the constitution and not. All these things are bourgeois interests. And in fact, even the kind of politics that's playing out in Kenya today, I can tell you that the, a few public, critical public interest issues have been used to cover the bourgeois conspiracy. And now the proletariat are just tools in the hands of the bourgeoisie to advance their interests. So the people are always being used as tools, whether a particular government uh, a community is in government or not. So the people have always been left out of the equation. That is where the problem is. We even in Kenya came up with the devolved system of governance. Yeah. This devolved system of governance has still devolved the class system where some communities or some uh, clans get to control and have a sway of the power and resources within county governments while the other, the other communities and the other classes yeah. get to be disadvantaged. So the issue here about inclusivity is that we have got the flag of individualism being hoisted 
all through and all times. In fact, even majority of politicians who are in the opposition right now, if they were to be in government, they would want to advance individualism to benefit themselves and those who are close to them. Yeah. And that is the problem. We do not look at government as an entity or an enterprise that's supposed to serve the collective and the whole. We look at it in terms of benefiting ourselves. Just as a close, let me give the example of even, say, Japan. What is it that would make a cabinet secretary or a government official in Japan commit suicide or, in fact, relinquish office the moment he or she has been implicated in a graft case or when his or her ministry has been uh, flagged or uh, earmarked for poor performance? Yeah. They resign. It's about values. It's about conscientiousness. And I think that's what lacks here in East Africa, in Africa, and particularly in Kenya, that governance is seen as an avenue to advance personal interests and not to serve the people. Interesting. Uh, Ongama, w w what's your take on this, especially when it comes to uh, the aspects of, you know, what has been termed as democracy? You know, for, for those who sometimes even talk about it, they would say, you know, Kenya, one of the biggest democracies in East Africa. On the flip side, we have those who would be like, this is what you call democracy. You know, they would be like, I mean, I, I think I have a problem with that. T talk to us a bit about that understanding of the place of consensus and the place um, of, 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 you know, politics that is not destructive to the level of the magnitude that we've seen this week. You've muted your, your mic, Ongama. You can unmute. Thank you so oh, much. Sure. Sorry about that. So there are two things to bear in mind is that the part, the, 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 the political development of the two countries is slightly nuanced. In South Africa, the constitutional values are largely entrenched. Um, we haven't had an election yet that is challenged and therefore have not had a, the kind of grievance exploitation that can be associated with failure to accept democratic outcomes. Yeah. However, yeah. the same issues of an exclusive economy, in terms of which, in fact, it's quite the reverse in South Africa, where the minority, historically white uh, 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 elites, still control the economy of the country, and in fact have driven foreign direct investment into the rest of the continent and have an extractive attitude yeah. towards yeah. the economy of the country yeah. and have co-opted yeah. politicians into a system of racial capitalism. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so the challenge then is, the, is acknowledging how path dependent countries are when it comes to progressing towards a stabilized democracy. But at the center of it, is whether or not the economies are inclusive. And there's quite a lot that still needs to be done in the continent as far as democratizing production and, 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 and distribution processes. And uh, the role of the state has become uh, critical in ensuring that there's growth of industries which are owned and controlled by the excluded People have this tendency of saying we need to migrate away from primary industries, whereas, in fact, what th that migration should be driven by he lots of productivity in primary sectors such as agriculture and mining, and then leveraging with industrialization as well as uh, commercial sectors. Only in that way are we going to be able to create um, you know, mass jobs for people and therefore make them less likely or less susceptible to manipulation by uh, badly meaning politicians. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Degwa, I, I think if, if you're still with us, uh, I want to throw this question to you on, on, on the aspect of some of the uh, questions I've asked when it comes to consensus. Um, do you see this happening? Uh, do you see a sense of, you know, those who are within the political spaces or positions of influence saying, look, for the sake of the country, I mean, I'm going to be the bigger person because we are seeing that much as we want to pursue or push for grievances through the streets, but it has its 
cones that are actually affecting all of us as a nation. Let us get to the table and have a conversation on dealing with the issues that affect all of us as a nation, a country called Kenya. Is this something that is possible from where you sit? Is this something that you could be thinking about from the quarters that you mingle and integrate in? Uh, may I say that uh, the, during this time in Angwe, uh, the, the extractive regime, and I insist, the, ex, the current extractive brutal regime has taken to its heels and said that they will not speak to anyone because they won the election. Mm -hmm. The conversation that we can only have is a conversation that will address the grievances that have been brought forth. And may I mention that other than just speaking from the tops of our vehicles and from the streets. Mm -hmm. On Monday, we had set ourselves to present a petition to the president for his consideration. And that petition would have formed the basis upon which perhaps a conversation would have ensued. And what the people met was serious police brutality, making, uh, preventing the, pre uh, the presentation of that petition. Mm. Had that petition be presented to the president, he would have realized that the petition has formed the basis, or it, it, it would have invited people, perhaps on a road table, to think the, uh, the mechanisms of how to address the, the current challenge. But now, what, what this extractive regime has taken is, is a quite toxic position, because for that they have taken a position that right or Dinga, Masaka Moshimua Masa Karua, Moshimua Kalonzo Mosioka, Moshimua Jeremia Kioni, Moshimua Eugene Wamalwa, Moshimua Oparanya and others are pushing or are going to the streets to make sure that they get half of the government, what we notoriously call here in Kenya as Mesumkat. They have completely misconceived uh, the, 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 the whole idea. So they, they, they have blocked the entire process. We cannot even negotiate these things in Parliament because in Parliament they have bought all members of Azimio party. Mm. To the extent that, that, that in Parliament our people have been reduced to a voiceless minority. And then we ha the, the, our people in Parliament have been, uh, uh, have been uh, uh, banked up like they are in opposition. And I have Javas mentioned the word constitution several. Whereas our constitution is very clear that in this country we do not have an opposition. They have decided to look at the minority as the opposition. And one thing, Javas, we must all understand, and our viewers and our listeners must understand, is that the Kenyan constitution has defined how parliament will be administered. Mm. And it has created two sides. It has kept the side of the majority and the side of the minority. Mm. But irrespective of whichever state one may be, both the majority and the minority have three functions. Mm. The first function is to oversight government. The second function is to legislate. The third function is to present. Let me address the question of oversight. And the reason why people will go to the street on Monday, on Thursday, on Monday, on that day, until the grievance is heard. Parliament have decided to negate its duty. They have decided to limit their powers. They have decided to negatively legislate, to curtail their ability to oversight yeah. government. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I want to ask you this question. You, you say that you wanted to march to state house to present a petition. This is what you say. And, and you say that that petition, um, uh, you know, could have had X, Y, Z that could have at least formed the basis of a conversation. Have you seen or did you see that petition yourself? Yeah, the petition is there. It is well drafted, raising very grievous issues. I saw the petition. The petition is there. Mm -hmm. and so, I saw it. Uh, yes. and, so, and so you believe that even if today... Um, you know, the faction that you support was to come to power, they would turn around the current situation in Kenya, like, you know, by snap, that the cost of living will go down, 
um, you know, uh, the, 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 the drought crisis will also just uh, disappear. What, what would be the basis of, of feeling that you can be able to achieve this? Anangwe, there is something that we are all missing, uh, mm. uh, we are all missing out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one of the things that affects a country's economy uh, grievously yeah. is the ability of a country and the political class to instill confidence, yeah. even to our, our external investors, foreign investors, and internal investors. Yeah. Now, if you have an extractive regime mm -hmm. that is not instilling confidence to our people, that is the domestically and internationally, mm. then there is no way you can stabilize the economy. Mm. If Azimio Almoja took, or rather uh, was in a position of power, they would have one, one key and major uh, link of instilling confidence. This confidence would have, would have, would have brought state the foreign exchange, it would have brought with it the, the, the the, the foreign investment issues, and those are what is lacking. Mm. Our people confident. Okay. The foreign foreigners do not have. Let, 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 let me give one point. Yeah. Why the foreigners do not even have confidence? The regime has taken it to itself that they are even going to start kicking people out of their land. You have had members of parliament saying that they are going to incite the people that uh, Javas was calling the proletariat to invade people's land. I, 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 I did not hear that. I don't know, I don't know where that is, uh, that, that is able to be substantiated right here on this particular show. I, I will not be able to substantiate that. I did not uh, see any of that. I did not hear that. But what I heard was the issue of the company, um, uh, the nation or the current government being a company uh, from that perspective. But I want us to start wrapping up because we're also running out of time. Um, where do we go from here? Javas, um, I want you to just tell us in a nutshell, under 30 seconds. Uh, no room for consensus because the current regime has refused to talk to us and we think we're doing the right thing as per the constitution. I mean, where do we go from here? Well, we need to go where sobriety leads us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not anarchy and not mere politics. Yeah. The issue of the right to demonstrate is in the constitution. It is captured in Article 20 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It is captured in Article 21 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. It is captured in Article 10 of the Banjul Protocol and yeah. the Constitution of Kenya uh, in Article 37. This is very crucial, and we know very well that all these articles that I've made mention of or cited provide that every kind of demonstration or protest must be peaceable, yeah. or uh, people should be unarmed. Even as the mayor, for instance, has written to the security agencies, the police, to provide security. That demonstrates that they are pursuing that channel. Mm -hmm. It's also important that, for example, in the what has been demonstrated by EFF in South Africa, yeah. Azimia should have marshals that guide its people not to destroy property because people misconstrue demonstrations to mean looting, violence, uh, hitting the police or fighting the police. That's not necessary because even in Kibra, here in Kenya, in Nairobi, it is the people who yeah. started... Uh, throwing stones at the police. So I think we need to uh, be sober enough as a people yeah. to ensure that we do not uh, risk the businesses of ordinary people uh, because we are pursuing certain political interests. Right. Because when politicians incite the people, yeah. the people get incited and they get to be destructive. Perfect. Thank you. O Ongama, just in under like 20 seconds, where do we go from here? The way forward is what? Your mic is muted. <laughs> Unless they uh, precipitate a crisis. Yeah, yeah. And I think that it's important uh, for governments in the continent to listen and address issues and stop, uh, you know, responding based on who is bringing the matters to the table. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it is particularly that time that we start wrapping up and part of the 
process of wrapping up is just really quickly checking out some of the feedback that has been coming uh, through uh, during the particular conversation. I just quickly look into the hashtag. Like I said earlier on, it is the hashtag that we are following throughout the show to enable us to be able to understand what you're saying. I have Aina Think Tank who says, um, what can large countries like Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria do to avoid the continuous chaos leading to violence, death of citizens and disorder in the name of freedom? If those countries can't apply consensus politics like Rwanda or Japan, what's the alternative? That's a very interesting uh, tweet right there. I have Chris um, uh, who is saying, but uh, Anangwe, isn't this an issue related to inflation which is rampant all over the world? which is now being used by opposition leaders to try uh, to regain power or destabilize current governments. Remember, this conversation has to continue, and it, uh, it, it continues beyond the four walls right here, and it continues on our online platforms. And the hashtag to always add is the summit RW. We'll definitely be able to uh, continue this conversation uh, in the course of the week, and we'll be able to have another interesting topic uh, next week, uh, Wednesday, 9 p.m. I want to say thank you to our panelists who joined us from far and wide in Nairobi and in South Africa. Thank you so much for making time. And on behalf of Carol, who also was not able to make it, we want to say thank you for making time. As always, my name is Eugene. Anangwe. Goodbye.